Now, sheep have been a part of the Australian scene really since the First Fleet. And we've got some statistics there from the Australian Bureau of Statistics on the number of sheep that uh, sheep, cattle and pigs in 1800. There we start to talk, you see reference to those merino sheep that were imported into Australia and they're the ones that form the basis of the wool industry. Now the beginnings of the wool industry, as we know probably, um, anyone who's done a little bit of reading will have detected that they brought livestock with them when the first fleet arrived. Not only did they bring convicts and marines, they brought some livestock. But of course, food was a real problem in the early days of the colony, and we know of the hungry years and the difficulties that they faced, uh, not the least because the Australian climate was so different from what they were used to, and of course the arrival of the second fleet uh, where so many of the convicts were so very sick. So very difficult days in the early days, early times of the colony. But in 1796, two ships went across to the Cape of Good Hope to purchase live cattle. And I'm always amused about things like this because, you see, people are given jobs to do. And yes, they, uh, the HMS Supply brought back 27 cows and 35 sheep, according to the historical records of New South Wales. But the Reliance came back with also some uh, cows, bulls and some more sheep. Captain Henry Waterhouse, now he is a man who obviously worked out that there were things happening that he could get involved in. And so he brought in some sheep, that, three of them were for Governor King, but 26 sheep, according to historical records in New South Wales. And he was fortunate, he and William Kent were fortunate to be able to buy some sheep from the widow of Colonel Gordon. And Colonel Gordon had apparently been importing Spanish sheep and they were the, uh, what were really, the, I guess, the foundation of what we think about fine wool sheep of today. Now, poor sheep, I do feel very sorry for them. The difficult voyage, they lost 13, but he managed to get half of them here. And they were, that is, the beginnings. And, of course, he supplied John MacArthur and Samuel Marsden. So he also sold some to William Cox when he left the colony. Waterhouse is an interesting man. Um, he has an entry in the Australian Dictionary of Biography. He didn't like Australia or New South Wales. He didn't like it very much at all. But in many ways, we tend to overlook his contribution, at least certainly I hadn't realised, I have to say, taking it at a personal level, I hadn't realised exactly how important his contribution is to the history of the fine wool production in Australia. We tend to think particularly of John MacArthur, of course Elizabeth MacArthur as well, and Samuel Marston, not to think about the man who actually first, first brought those, those sheep in. Now, this is a nice little quote from uh, Governor King. He is making the point there that the, the government supply, the government, government sheep, uh, were in a wretched state and uh, which I'm not uh, saying that really would be some time before any advantage of that kind can be obtained from them. But the flocks of the individuals have greatly improved the fleeces. So this is in 1800, already by then, it was beginning to have the benefit of the importation of those sheep from Colonel Gordon's flock. When we talk about the wool industry, of course, the production of the wool is only, and I know I'm speaking here to people who know a great deal more about it than I do, but the production of the wool, getting the wool, getting the sheep to grow the wool, getting the wool off the sheep's back, is only part of the story. You have to find a market. And although later on in the colony of New South Wales there was a, a woolen mill and they did, uh, wool was being woven and, being, and clothing being made, the idea of England was the market, and of course England continued to be um, our market for a very, very long time. And in 1807, <coughs> we had the first consignment being sent to England. I like this story of Samuel Marston having his own wool woven and made into a suit, a suit I should say, by Thompsons of uh, Horsebirth in York Yorkshire. And I'm presuming anyone who is up on the history of clothing in the UK would probably know who Thompsons were. But uh, it certainly impressed George III and he was given, that is, Marston was giving, uh, given the present of some more merinos. 
Now, in some things I have read, it says that Marsden was the first to export and have wool sold in England, and he beat MacArthur uh, by a short period of time. Now, I, I don't know if that's a contested history. I like to think of the two of them being in competition. But uh, by 1812, 400 pounds of, of Marsden's wool was sold, 45 pence a pound. And in 1822, the Society of Arts in London presented John MacArthur with two medals. So by then, he was the one being recognised as being the leader in the wool industry. Sheep statistics. This graph, which is from the Australian Bureau of Statistics website, starts in 1861, and I'll come to some of those dips, and we'll talk about those in a moment. But just some facts and figures that by 1820, the number of sheep in Australia had reached approximately 120,000. So they were mainly meat sheep and from the Cape of Good Hope. But in the next 30 years, the pastoral industry expanded into, and this is where it's important in terms of what I'm going to speak about directly, opened lands in and around Sydney and beyond the Blue Mountains, as well as Port Phillip and Portland Bay. Imports of sheep continued to grow because there was a demand for the, the meat and the wool. Now, by 1840, the imports of sheep had reached 20,000, and by 1848, the export of sheep had reached almost 90,000. Now, in the 1840s, some of you will remember a few things, quite dramatic things, in the history of New South Wales happened. The transportation of convicts effectively ceased in 1840. There were a few uh, ships coming in, for some from South Australia, up until 1842. There was an abortive effort to introduce another form of convict transportation, which was uh, euphemistically called convict exiles, and that was attempted an introduction of that in the late 1840s. Of course, with the cessation of convict transportation, a lot of there was a lot of concern in the colony. What were we going to do? Will all be ruined? Said Hanrahan. So then you start to get a lot more assisted immigrants, skilled assisted immigrants coming into the country. But in the 1840s, there was a major depression. And uh, that, of course, uh, had an impact on both the production of wool, but also had an impact on all kinds of communities. And I'll show you a little some information just in a minute about that. So the 1840s depression, there is an index on State Records New South Wales website, and I'll be mentioning that quite a bit today. So I used to work at State Records, those who know me. But State Records has a lot of indexes on its website, and all of the indexes are free. And I just did a search here by locality and occupation. That's the wonderful thing about doing searches on, on databases. Yes, you can look for a particular individual. You might be wanting to do some research on Hugh Doherty, but you can also do a search by locality, by mudging, and by occupation. I just chose farmer, but there could have been any number of other occupations. And you'll see there quite a lot of people affected by the depression of the 1840s and consequently forced into insolvency. The 1890s, and I'll, you'll see there, there's that dip on that graph going right down. In the 1890s, there was both a depression and the prolonged drought. In fact, that drought was so severe, it is known as the Federation drought. It extended uh, beyond 1901. The sheep numbers fell from 106 million in 1892 to 54 million in 1903. And the droughts continued in that early part of the century. During the First World War, the British government purchased the wool from Australia at 55% above pre-war values. So it really meant that because they were being, the wool was being used to uniforms, etc., so the sheep number started to be, to be restored. By the late 1920s, Australia had 103 million head of sheep. By comparison, for example, during the First World War, we had a population of about 4 million, so lots more sheep than people. So by the late 1920s, Australia was producing 440 tonnes of wool, and that accounted for 17% of the world's sheep numbers during this time that Australia produced just on half of the world's merino wool. 
Okay, so you can see there ups and downs, but you can see there were some major effects in the 1890s. And in the 1890s, depression and drought. And this time I just did a search by locality because one of the things that I wanted to stress here, and it's not particularly necessarily related to the history of land settlement, but it shows that something like a depression and a drought, that it can affect a whole community. So it's not just the farmers and the graziers who may be forced into bankruptcy or insolvency in the 1840s. There can be a flow on effect to the whole community. And that affects, when we talk about our local history, it's about the lives of people as much as the events that happen around them. And lots of those events are, of course, things that are beyond the control of the local community. Now, this is from um, an ST Gill, and I, it shows, because, of course, the wool, again, we have to get the wool from Mudgee, and we had to get it across to Sydney to be sold. Okay, so what was happening with the land? We've talked a little bit here about what was happening with the wool. We had Waterhouse, the entrepreneurial Waterhouse, bringing back those sheep. We had a few of them dying, the poor things, on the trip from the Cape. And we saw the growth of the wool industry with the pioneers of uh, MacArthur and Marsden. But what was happening on the land? Now, as we all know, Governor Philip was empowered to grant land. He didn't grant that much land, actually, not as much as he perhaps could have. Land continued to be granted, and during the Rum Rebellion, there were grants made. Macquarie, anyone ever doing research into land grants, you often times, I know when I was working, people would say to me, why are there so many that are being made in 1810? Well, it was because the ones that had been granted during the Rum Rebellion were cancelled and reissued by Macquarie. And as early as 1824, we started to have efforts to control squatting. The land was there. You know, the land was declared it was crown land. And of course, you say to people, you mustn't do things. Well, you know, human nature is what it is. But they did try to control squatting or unauthorised occupation of land. And there were ways that people could occupy land, which was different from having land granted to them. They could have a ticket of occupation or they could have an annual lease. Uh, you see references to people holding tickets of occupation and annual leases in the colonial secretary's correspondence in the period between 1788 and 1825. Now, who's had a look at the index to the colonial secretary's records when you've been doing some of your research? It's absolutely wonderful. The indexing was done on the State Records website. That index was done by State Records staff. And it's much, much more than a simple index, as in a couple of items of information. It is much closer to what we in the archival world would call a calendar, an actual listing of the contents, a summary listing of the contents of all of the correspondence. And I'm going to be coming back to that later on, but absolutely wonderful resource that's there right at your fingertips. The introduction of land by the sale of private tenure introduced in 1825. Land grants that were granted before were free, although people did have to pay quick rent. I'm not going to go into that now, but basically they were free. But by 1829, the government had said, we've only got the 19 counties, and uh, that's as far as, we, we, don't, we, we don't only have the 19 counties, but as far as the residents of New South Wales are concerned, uh, there's a line, as they say, drawn in the sand, and you must not go beyond those 19 counties unless you've got permission. In 1831, the introduction of all land then to be sold at public auction, other than the, the land that had been um, granted or, or promised earlier. So, things happening in the 1820s, 1830s. On one hand, we're saying to people, you can't go beyond the 19 counties unless we've given you a piece of paper to say you can. And on the other hand, saying, from now on, no more free grants, you have to buy land. So we start then to have serious regulations about trying to control squatting. And in 1836, we have an act which establishes seven squatting districts. And I'll explain a little bit about that. So the limits of location, we've got Initially, um, 1826, Governor Darling 
describing those limits of location and then we have our 19 counties. And there's a map, a map of those 19 counties. And then it's got that line saying the limits of location. But you know, in 1813, we had crossed the Blue Mountains and you can't then say to people, you can't go across, you can't go out of those 19 counties because in fact they built the road very, very quickly and you could get across the mountains very, in double quick time. So that was a significant move, but there are other things happening as well. As we mentioned, the, the fact that being told that no more free grants, that you, on one hand, you had to buy land, and then saying that there were ways that you could occupy land. Prior to the publication of the big report, the idea was that they would try to contain the land, but big spoke in very glowing terms about the possibility of pastoralism and the potential, particularly of that land that had been so-called discovered and well located by the, the surveyors. As we know, as we all know from our history, very quickly people moved beyond the area. And I've made a reference there to a little book publication by Campbell, and there is a copy here in the library, but I'll be talking about that because we're going to digitise that at the RAHS. So, the legislative solutions. 1833, we say, as an act for protecting the Crown lands from the encroachment, intrusion and trespass. They did appoint commissioners, but virtually that nothing could be done to stop them. By 1835, they had spread 300 miles from Sydney in two directions. I think, as happened so often in the New South Wales uh, administrative history, there's always a pragmatic solution. And the pragmatic solution was that they would give entitlement to people to be on the land, to uh, do powers to their stock on the land, by issuing licences. And so we have the first act to legalise and regulate squatting in 1836. It says that there will be leases of land by a government order of 1829 that talks about that, licences to depart to the, the vacant Crown lands beyond the limits of location will be granted on application to the Colonial Secretary. Now that's important because it wasn't simply an entitlement, a right, people actually had to make an application. And if you're familiar with the system, the convict system, the way that people were given tickets of leave, conditional pardons, certificates of freedom, etc., was on the basis of an application. Likewise, a grant of land on the basis of an application. And the application had to provide enough documentation to confirm that the person would be a worthy recipient of whatever benefit was being sought. But it also allowed the government and the government official to make a comment, to make a remark, and to make a decision based on the application. So, for those of you who have not used the Colonial Secretary's records, you may find that you'll be tempted into using them because the Colonial Secretary administered the issuing of these departuring licences for the first few years of its operation. So we have full-time commissioners of Crown land being appointed as well. And they were each assigned a district and the guy who was assigned the district of Bly was a man called Hunter. In 1839, they also introduced border police. And it was a very unpopular move because for one thing, most of the border police were former convicts. I don't know why, but people didn't like that. But what they really didn't like was that the cost of employing the border police would be defrayed by a tax, an additional tax, that they would have to pay, as well as the licence fee. And that was very, very unpopular. They were, the border police were disbanded in 1846, but they operated for almost 10 years. We have here the listing of the commissioners of Crown land, and that's this from this nice little book by Campbell. And uh, there we have Graham Hunter, Esquire. Now the commissioner's role, they were very powerful people, essentially, because certainly one of their responsibilities was to stop, as I've noted, quoted there, the atrocities that had been committed beyond the boundaries, both by the Aborigines, that's the term that was used, and on them. 
So they had a magisterial responsibility. They carried out, and it's the second last dot point, they carried out itineraries and inspections. And as a result of those itineraries and inspections, they created some very, very important records for those studying the early history of land settlement in and around Mudgee and elsewhere. Now, so they were very, very important people and they, their correspondence, the correspondence between the commissioners and the colonial secretary and later the chief commissioner of Crown Lands are pivotal to an understanding of the administration of the land beyond the limits of location and the land that was held by leasehold. So there we had these border police that no one really liked. In fact, I've never even ever had anyone ask me if their ancestor was a border policeman, so it must have been pretty awful <laughs> no one wants to claim them as an ancestor. Okay, in 1847, we start to get some changes. And in a way, these changes were significant because in terms of the division of the colony of New South Wales, the way that the land geographically is divided, it hasn't changed all that much. The big change was that, uh, and as you will see with the examples, the departuring licences, those licences that allowed people, after they had passed, gone through the tests, submitted their application, etc., were very expensive and they were only for one year. So there was a lot of opposition, a lot of concern. People thought that was pretty unfair. So in 1847, those leases were changed and you could get one for up to 14 years. And just a little bit of administrative history. They had a chief commissioner who was appointed in 1849. And that office existed until 1870, generating some records, very, very useful records. Unfortunately, a lot of that material was burnt in the Garden Palace fire, so there are big gaps here and there uh, with the, in the later records because of that fire. And just to bring you up to speed a little bit, the Robertson Land Acts, very important because what the government was doing was saying there's all this Crown land and basically taking it back and then reissuing it as conditional purchase to pe and conditional leases to people. So again, a very uh, revolutionary move in 1861 and there were some amendments, quite significant amendments in the 1870s. Now, so the land was divided up into the three areas, Eastern, Central and Western Division. 